Well, hello, listeners. This is Josh Cohen hijacking the feed of your normal host, Steve Guerra. As some of you may know, I am his partner over at the Parthenon Podcast Network, and I have a podcast called Eyewitness History. I decided to hijack his airwaves because I wanted to present to you a special anniversary episode that I've done for Eyewitness History, where I've showcased highlights from some of my favorite interviews that I've done over the past year. And I'm going to leave it right there. So here is my podcast, Eyewitness History. What was it like to hear about the JFK assassination? Or America's triumph over Hitler? Or seeing Queen at Live Aid? Our past is a collection of stories that brings us to now. Welcome to the Eyewitness History Podcast where we view history through the eyes of the people that watched the events that shaped our world. Here's your host, Josh Cohen, and these are their stories. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Eyewitness History. This is, of course, Josh Cohen. I wanted to drop in on your podcast feed this morning on this lovely Thursday because I wanted to celebrate one year of interviews and 50 podcast episodes with you. It's hard to believe it's already been a year. And what I wanted to do to commemorate and celebrate the year of interviews and 50 episodes is I wanted to dig into the vault and bring up some of my favorite episodes and showcase some of the highlights with you. This first highlight comes from one of my all-time favorite interviews. It's with Frank DeAngelis, the former principal of Columbine High School. In the episode, we cover a lot. We talk about the events of that day, what was going on inside the school during that tragedy, what he was thinking. We talk about the possible motives of the two shooters, and we discuss the very seldom spoken about basement tapes, among many other topics. Here, Frank DeAngelis describes the events of April 20th, 1999, from his perspective. Walk me through, please, then, April 20th, 1999. Where were you, and how did you find out that there was something wrong? Yeah. Well, on April 20th, a beautiful, beautiful Colorado spring day. Uh, you know, we, we have snow, but we have sunshine about 300 days out of the year, and it was one of those beautiful days. But I didn't start out at Columbine. I actually started out at uh, our students were uh, future business leaders of America were receiving awards. So they invited me to be there to, you know, congratulate them. So I'm late getting back to Columbine. And and when I got back, I was looking for a teacher, Kiki Leba, whose student taught at Columbine. He was on a one year contract and we had interviewed him the day before, and uh, it was a no-brainer. We were going to hire this guy. He was fantastic. The kids loved him, just a great addition. But I couldn't find him. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, when he came to my office, it was right at the beginning of A lunch. And we had two lunches, A lunch and B lunch. So I'm late getting downstairs for A lunch. Well, I'm sitting in my office and getting ready to talk to Kiki. And to this day, I'm not sure... I ever offered him the job, and we kind of laugh about it now, but he's still working at Columbine 23 years later. Wow. But the reason being is before I could offer him that, you know, the job and welcome to the Columbine family, you know, Rebels for Life, we're Columbine Rebels, and my secretary comes running towards the door, and I remember it so vividly, there was a little window just literally face-planted there, and I knew something was wrong. And she opened the door, and she said, Frank, there's been a report of gunfire bombs exploding, and it's not registering. I mean, I had been there for 20 years. I could count on two hands the number of fistfights we had. And so the first thing I'm thinking, it has to be a senior prank. You know, we're about a month away from graduation. And so run out of my office and tell her to, you know, call please 911. And mind you, 23 years ago, the only drills we did in Colorado were fire drills. Hmm. And now you look at all the drills that kids are learning from the time they enter elementary school, you know, run, hide and fight drills, you know, secure the perimeter. We didn't never had any of that. We did the best we could. So when I ran out of my office, Kiki went down one way. I went the other. And as soon as I came out of the office on my office doors, my worst nightmare became a reality because I encountered the gunman. And I remember it so vividly and everything just seemed to slow down. And later what I learned was 
you go through something called fight, flight, and freeze. And I went through and I thought I walked out very calmly, but I remember very distinctly what the gunman was wearing. Baseball cap turned backwards, white cutoff t-shirt, black vest, boots. And I just remember the shots being fired and glass breaking behind me. And all I kept thinking about, and it just slowed down, all I kept thinking about, what it was going to feel like to have a bullet pierce my body. Because I had never in my life encountered anything like that. And so I thought I walked very calmly, but I actually sprinted towards a gunman. And I know when my secretary, Susan White, and Kiki Leba saw me later outside, they were shocked because the last they saw me, I was sprinting right towards a gunman. And I've had police officers say, Frank, why? You're unarmed. Why did you sprint towards one gunman? And one reason, one reason only. My girls, I had some kids that were in trouble. And there were about 25 girls that were coming out of the locker room to go to a physical education class, and they were unaware of what was happening. And I hurriedly got them there. And I knew in my mind that if I got them into the gym and we'd be able to shut the door, and then once I was able to check outside to see if it was safe, because there was a report of snipers outside, snipers on the building. I said, once I got them outside, we'd be in a safe place. Well, Everything was going as planned. I'm keeping them calm. And then all of a sudden, I pull on the gym door, and it's locked, and we're in trouble. And the girls are screaming. The girls start praying. And literally, the gunman is turning the corner. We hear the sounds of the shots getting closer, the boots on the ground. And I had about 35 keys on a key ring. And I, I was a principal that I wore a suit every day or a sport coat every day. I reached in my pocket, and the first key I pulled out, I stuck in the door, and it opened it on the first try. And it wasn't that this key was specially marked. And now when I go out and do presentations with people, I said, if you need to get to that key, if you need to get to that button, you need to be able to do it quickly. This key was not specially marked. It was just mingled in with all the others. And I was so fortunate to be able to do that on the first try, because if I didn't, more than likely, I wouldn't be conducting this interview and those girls would have died. And it was uh, several years ago, Columbine girls softball team was playing in the state championship. And so I, I'm at the game and all of a sudden a young lady comes up to me and I recognize her. She was one of the girls with me on April 20th and she's crying. I'm crying get pretty emotional. And she spins me around. She said, Mr. D., you see that girl there in right field? I said, yeah. She said, thank you for finding that key because that's my daughter. And if you didn't find that key, she wouldn't be playing in this game. And it got very emotional. And so it was from there, I immediately went outside. And the thing that's so disturbing, and it's it, there's no one to blame, but it was a protocol at the time to secure the perimeter. Right. You know, and we had a school resource officer that was exchanging gunfire and he was being told that you can't go in until the SWAT team arrived. And that was one of the most frustrating things in talking to the three or four hundred people that were trapped in the building. They were being told help is on the way. And all of a sudden, all these officers are arriving, paramedics are arriving, but no one's coming in the building. And I got outside and I was actually helping the police officers draw floor plans. At one point, they were going to put a body armor on me to go in the building, shut off the fire alarm, because it was so loud that the police could not, the SWAT team could not communicate once they did arrive. And so by the time the SWAT team got there, it was about 58 minutes after the original shots were fired. And and it's not the police's fault. I have defended them to the very max because that was a protocol. And I even was on the street with many of the officers who were friends of mine, and they said, you know, this is crazy. We've been sworn to protect and serve, and we're standing outside. But that was a protocol at the time. Now you look at the protocol, first officers are immediately going in. And most of these events are over within three to five minutes. So that's what happened on that particular day. In this next highlight, we hear from an interview that I did with Spike Edney, the keyboardist for Queen. We talked about a lot in this particular interview, uh, his career, certainly his time working with Queen. My favorite part of the interview is when we discussed him performing at Live Aid, what it was like on stage, and he discusses a particular worry that he had as the band transitioned from Bohemian Rhapsody to Radio Gaga. But let's hear it right now from Queen's unofficial fifth member, Spike Edney. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about the energy inside Wembley at the time while you're on stage. Can you recall what you were feeling? 
Um, it was very exciting because once we played uh, Radio Gaga with the hand clap, I think that Gaga was the second tune. Mm-hmm. And if I was nervous, I wasn't too nervous because I kind of, you know, had faith that we would go over okay because we were match fit and had been touring and knew that what the audience response would be to certain uh, pieces of music. And, of course, starting off with Bo Rap, that got everybody's attention and they all went crazy. But then going into Gaga, my only concern was that I have to control the synthesizer part and uh, that goes all the way through it and uh, I have to play that. And I was just concerned that nothing went wrong with that because uh, earlier in the tour I'd had some issues mm. with the uh, keyboard and it had uh, had been a problem. And my hand slipped on one of the controls and <laughs> created chaos. It was all... All stupidity and an um, operator error. It wasn't the keyboard itself. It was my uh, my handling of it that was wrong. But um, but that had been uh, quite a while before, and I'd got my routine down and learned what to do and what not to do in order to keep it in pristine readiness. And uh, so when we got to the Gaga and I pressed the key that starts off that introduction, my heart was in my mouth, to tell you the truth, because if it hadn't worked, then... And, uh, well, I just don't know. That the alternative could keep me awake at night. Anyway, it worked perfectly, and they all clapped and joined in. And then I thought, okay, we're good um, to get that kind of reaction on the second song. It was, we get, I knew that we had We Will Rock You and We Are The Champions to come. So it was a done deal. Fish in a barrel uh, after that. Next, we're going to hear from retired firefighter Michael O'Connell. In the crush of chaos after two planes hit the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001, Michael O'Connell raced from his home on Long Island in New York to his firehouse in Queens, where he was training as a probationary fireman for the FDNY. From there, the then 25-year-old joined a busload of firefighters to the burning buildings. During the trip, their chief announced that the World Trade Center's twin towers had collapsed. It was his incredible story of the pass alarms that especially stood out for me. Here, he describes what the scene was like when he got there. Could you please describe the experience of getting the call about the World Trade Center 2001? So um, just a little backdrop. I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I, I got on the New York City Police Department in 1998. So I wasn't kind of shy to civil service. I, I, I was 22 years old. I was young, very immature. Uh, getting on the cops kind of prepared myself, uh, you know, for, for what was in store when it came to emergencies. Uh, and then I had gotten on, I, I got the call for the fire department when I was 25 years old, May of 2001. So only a few months shy of, of 9-11 hitting. And believe it or not, uh, you know, I was a probe, a probationary firefighter. Um, we were still in the academy, although I was in the field doing field training at uh, Engine 273, Ladder 129 in Flushing, Queens. Uh, that day on 9-11, I was home uh, on Long Island, and a friend had called, and had he had worked in Brooklyn. He wasn't a fireman, but he had a private business in Brooklyn. He had seen from his office that the you know first tower had been hit, and that there was you know billowing smoke coming from the tower. So with that being said, I threw the TV on, uh, and just like most people, when you're watching the scene of what's going on, you see the second plane go in. And right then there, realizing what it is and being a terrorist attack and knowing that the first one wasn't an accident, you know, what do we have to do? Every cop, fireman, civil service, you know, we all got recalled into the city. And like I just told you, me being uh, living on Long Island, Nassau County, I worked in Flushing, Queens. It's probably the fastest I ever get to my firehouse. I probably made it there in about 15 minutes hmm. uh, from, from here to there. Beautiful you know, morning. Flew in, got there. Obviously, um, these guys were already ready to go. And the fact that we were first due to uh, Shea Stadium, which is the Met Stadium, uh, previous Met Stadium, now City Field. Uh, we were first due truck engine to City Field. They used the parking lot of Shea Stadium as a staging area to send – you know, fire companies in. So they already had buses uh, ready to go. Uh, the captain, Shelly Barakas, who has now uh, deceased of, is now deceased of 9-11 cancer. I was under his wing that day with along with a couple of the senior men of that company. 
and we were in teams of four, one officer, three firefighters, and we got on the bus, uh, all teamed up, knowing kind of not really not knowing what we were in store for. Uh, coming down the West Side Highway uh, at that stage of the game, the towers had already collapsed, so we were getting communication from from the site um, into into our bus. And then we were being told that, you know, there were numerous planes hijacked. Uh, we had heard about the, the, the plane that had gone down in, uh, that hit the Pentagon and the plane that had gone down in uh, Shanksville, Pennsylvania. So just like everybody else, you kind of know you're under attack. You don't know what's happening. And me being 25, being extremely um, young and naive to not just the world, but the fire department only having a few months on, you know, I knew to just keep my mouth shut, my eyes open, my ears open, and just do what I was told. Um, we got off the bus, and with the collapse already happening, a lot of people already still making their way towards us, filled with, you know, filled with debris. They were covered in debris. Uh, I happened to run into a couple of firemen that I knew. Thank God they got away. And our job at that point was to get to the site and do what we do, is you know, search, rescue, and see if we can get any sort of life out of there um unfortunately uh that wasn't the case you know we weren't successful on that front as you know now um but we were determined uh like i said i followed my captain and the team that i was on down there right away instantaneously from the outskirts just trying to sift through debris and see if there's any kind of human life that was uh alive at the time to, to get them out of there uh it wasn't too much of a it wasn't a graphic scene uh, is what i could tell you is because um you know you're talking 220 stories of office building and you're not realizing that day you're talk talking all of that office space two towers down how many people are in that building what are we going coming up upon um and i could tell you that it was almost like being on the scene of a movie because it was something that i i grew up traveling into Manhattan with my family coming over the 59th street bridge or coming, you know, downtown, downtown area into the Williamsburg bridge, you saw those towers up and to like now walk into that scene where they're not standing anymore. And you're talking X amount of space. That's just now just huge piles of, of steel dust rubble. Um, it was completely like shocking. You know, it was, you know, it's, it's, it was something that you, you couldn't kind of comprehend in the moment, but I guess the job in itself and knowing kind of what you were there to do kind of took over and we went in there with the best intent to try and help. The outskirts of it was, you know, a little bit more of a, of a scene for us because people that were trying to run away from the building, uh, weren't successful. So those were like the first kind of casualties between people that had jumped and people that had kind of just tried running away and weren't successful at it. Um, so we did our best job to, to give those people the best um, privacy we could for them and, and help in the best way we could. Um, and as the day progressed, you know, you started realizing that, um, you know, you weren't going to be successful here. You know, we, we, so knowing as we were going through the day, you know, in the hopes of, you know, finding somebody, uh, finding one of our brothers, I mean, you know, you, you, you're on a team, you know, in that moment, you know, you're in the firehouse, but you know that, you know, throughout the city, there's eight to 10, 10,000 firemen and there's a total recall. Like how many guys did we just lose? And that's kind of like also surfacing in your brain. And at the time being 25 years old, I'm not married. I don't have children. But that's kind of like weighing on me because like part of the job getting on and seeing these guys and meeting some of their children at events and stuff, uh, you know, they're just like anybody else. They, they come, they do their job. They're amazing at what they do, but they go home to be a dad, to be a mom, to be, you know, a brother, a sister, uh, a son. And to know that, you know, we were losing without question number of guys like typically losing one fireman in a fire is complete devastation losing 343 uh in one day is almost unheard of 
Um, it's never happened on the you know fire department history, something to that magnitude. And I was, you know, in the midst of experiencing something that uh, that you didn't really know how it was going to take shape. Not just you know loss of life, but the reaction to it, and and how many children no longer have their father, uh, how many women don't have their their husbands, um, and the biggest memory for me which you know kind of even though i don't get to be a fireman anymore it keeps me going the the memory of these guys because some of them were near and dear to my heart you know i lost six guys from my proby class anthony rodriguez stood right next to me through each month he was married with three children that day and his fourth was born uh, i believe on september 12th and i believe the baby's name was born, uh, uh, named hope and the hope that daddy would come home uh, and unfortunately, we didn't find Anthony along with the five other of my brothers from the academy. I lost dear friends from high school. Mikey Kiefer was lost that day. Somebody who was just totally enamored with being a fireman, always knew what he wanted to do. Went and did his job. He only got a short time to kind of accomplish that mission. But he accomplished it on a day that, you know, goes down in infamy. Um, but the the memory that sticks out to me that I was just about to tell you was, uh, you know, when you're a fireman, you wear Scott Packs. You know, it's a breathing apparatus that helps us breathe in a smoke-filled environment. Um, attached to that Scott Pack is an alarm called a pass alarm. And if you're laid motionless for a certain period of time, it l lets out like a loud screeching noise um, to basically tell us as the guys that are in the job, somebody's down. The pass alarm's not going off. We can hear them. They might not be able to communicate to us, but we can go get to them because the alarm's being sounded. Um, well, when we had first arrived on that scene and the hours and maybe even a few days that passed, that's all we heard were those pass alarms. So that was our brothers underneath that pile that we couldn't get to. Um, it's a memory that's etched into my brain. It will never go away. It's something that, you know, when I do these interviews, I talk about because you're talking about selfless human beings that kind of put everything aside, their wives, children, um, own safety, their own you know, passions in life to run into that building to make sure that they got somebody out. And they, they accomplished more than I will ever in my life. Um, and I lived through that, knowing those past alarms that they went in to get human life out and they did it extremely successfully. They saved thousands of human, human beings from, from dying that day. Um, and then to hear their alarms going off and they were no longer with us. It's a, it's a memory of, of mine that I try and just hold near and dear to my heart to basically let it be known to myself that, you know, who do I have to be, you know, as a human being, um, you know, try and be selfless, try and, uh, try and, you know, be a good human being, try and take care of others, try and, you know, give more than I take. And I, I learned that lesson that day. You know, I was probably a punk kid, 25 years old, 22 when I got in the fire, you know, the police department, 25 in the fire department, just running around, having fun, you know, immature in life. And, you know, that day, you know, taught me a lot. And it taught me kind of how to grow up and be a, a good human being or try try to be at least. And now I'm trying to raise three human beings to do the same. And I'm hoping that they don't have to learn that lesson off of a day like that. Um, and they'll get it through maybe my knowledge and what I went through. And maybe, you know, there will be some experiences that they'll learn good and bad. But those pass alarms going off is something that will you know, forever be etched into my brain. And those guys, those 343 brothers of mine, along with the police department, Port Authority guys, um, anybody that gave their lives that day to help others, you know, it's, they forever changed my life, for sure. That was truly an incredible story. Next, I'd like you to hear from Hugh Fink. Hugh Fink is a fairly legendary writer for Saturday Night Live and stand-up comedian. What I find truly fascinating about him is he actually wrote Chris Farley's last comedy sketch for Saturday Night Live. This was the famous El Nino sketch. Here, Hugh Fink tells me what that experience was like. I'd love to know then, Hugh, what was it like working with Chris Farley and writing that El Nino sketch? I love working with Chris. I only worked with him at Saturday Night Live that time when he came back to host, right? Because right. he had left the show. But I was friendly with Chris through David Spade. They were great buddies. And I did a couple projects with Chris and David to promote their movie Black Sheep. Mm -hmm. So 
when Farley would come to LA, I'd sometimes hang with him. When Farley would come to Los Angeles, I'd hang out with him and I'd see him in New York sometimes. And um, we got along great. He liked when I made fun of Spade. That was his favorite thing because he and Spade had that type of friendship where they totally busted on each other. <laughs> As a friend of Spade's, I'd bust on him and Farley loved when uh, I would make fun of Spade. So it was a huge loss for those of us who knew Chris and worked with him. You know, was it a loss that was shocking? Sadly, I can't say that. But still so young, and he was 33. Yeah. And he had so much left as a great actor, performer to give. Yeah, it's true. You know, there are some people that the humor sort of like permeates off of them to the point where they could almost be standing still, not doing anything, and they'll make you laugh. There's a few of them for me. Tim Conway's one, I would say Larry David, and Chris Farley as well. Yeah, that's a good analysis. I think Farley had that gift where before he even opens his mouth, you like him and want to laugh. Yeah. So then for the El Nino sketch, I'm just curious about the experience of writing that. I'm specifically curious about that brilliant pause that he takes. Did you write that pause, Hugh? Do you mean of the Nino? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So for our audience, well, perhaps you can give a little context on the joke yeah. and then go from there. Sure. So one of the pop culture phenomenons at the time Chris hosted the show was there was this weather front. I don't know if you call it a hurricane or a, but it was called El Nino. And the whole world was talking about how it was going to devastate the world. The Weather Channel was covering El Nino nonstop. So I decided how hilarious would it be if Chris Farley played the weather front El Nino. And the way he would do that is as a championship wrestler named El Nino. So the line that I wrote, that was actually one of the first jokes I came up with for the whole sketch that I think is the most memorable line is he goes, for those of you who don't know, El Nino is a Spanish word meaning the Nino. That's always was the impetus for the sketch. I don't recall whether I had to coach Chris on how to say it. I think that it was pretty clear based on how I put it in the script, how to say it. And he did. And he was a guy who would very much be open to taking notes. So if he was saying it in dress rehearsal in a way that I didn't want, I definitely would have told him, hey, Chris, you need to say it like this, because he was very respectful of writers. Mm. But it's really cool that I happened to write the last sketch Farley ever did. Next, I want us to hear from Barry Tompkins. Barry Tompkins is a multiple Emmy-winning sportscaster who joined HBO Boxing with Larry Merchant and Sugar Ray Leonard back in the 80s. Here, I asked him what was the most exciting fight he ever called and why. And his story actually quite surprised me. And now I give you Barry Tompkins. I'm extremely keen to discuss the infamous prior Argrello fight. So this would be, of course, just for our audience, our non-boxing fan listeners. This would be 1982. This would be the first one. Uh, we'll get to the controversy in a minute, obviously. But I'd love to know, what were you thinking and feeling as you were calling that particular fight? Can you recall? Yeah, the reason I can recall is that that was the greatest fight I ever did. Not in terms of the biggest fight. It wasn't the biggest fight. But in terms of everything that went into the making of that fight. You know, Aaron Pryor was an inner-city African-American guy. Arguello, and the fight was in Miami, largely mm -hmm. Hispanic. Arguello, obviously, was from Nicaragua. And at that time, there was a civil war in Nicaragua. And he was a big supporter of the Contras. And so that divided South Florida, you know, in that a lot of people in South Florida hated him. So there was a real volatile atmosphere going into that fight on both parts. You know, they wanted no part of Aaron Pryor. You know, in their minds, he was a thug, you know, and they wanted no part, or there was a portion of the population that wanted no part of Alexis Arguello either. Then there was that other side that supported him unlike anybody. Right. So it was a really, uh, even before a punch was thrown, it was a very volatile scene in the Orange Bowl, and it was almost a capacity crowd. I think there was about 65,000 people there. And they had decided, this is even before a punch was thrown, they had decided they weren't going to play any anthems at the beginning of the show because that could cause a problem. They had originally planned to do fireworks before the show, 
And they said, we're not doing fireworks because it could be a cover up for gunshots, you know. And so when we went on the air, all of that was understood. And we all knew there wasn't going to be any anthems. There wasn't going to be any fireworks. All of a sudden, they're shooting fireworks off, you know. And the whole stadium was dark. And, uh, you know, they darkened it to shoot the fireworks off, which nobody knew were going to be there. And, uh, and there was one light in the whole stadium, and it was on me because we just went on the air. And, you know, I had a lot of business to do. I had to, you know, intro the show and bring Larry in, Ray in. And, oh, Ray wasn't there, actually, for that show, I don't believe. I think it was just Larry and I. I think Ray had a fight, so he wasn't there. So I had to do all the business of the show. In the meantime, my mind is racing, thinking there's only one light on in this whole place. They're shooting off fireworks, which means somebody could take a shot. And the only place to aim is at me, <laughs> you know? And that really actually was racing through my mind as sure. I was trying to pay attention and, you know, get us on the air and get us into the show. So that's kind of set the scene for the whole fight, you know? And, and of course, once the fight started, it was a brutal fight. I mean, yeah. it was, the, you know, I always say it was the best, most exciting fight I've ever done in my life. Just in terms of the punishment that was dished out was, I'd never seen anything like it. Yeah, and remember, it was 15 rounds. Then, right. You know, it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal on both sides and nonstop on both sides. So, yeah, whenever anybody asks me what's the greatest fight you ever did, I always refer to that fight. You know, as I said, it wasn't the biggest fight, but it was from beginning to end with all the external stuff and the fight itself. It was just an unbelievable night. Very interesting story. It's always fascinating when politics and sports and history intersect in a manner such as that. Lastly, I'd like you to hear from Ronald Wayne. Ronald Wayne is sometimes known as the lost founder of Apple Computer Company, now, of course, Apple Incorporated. He founded the company on April 1st, 1976, with Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. Twelve days after founding the company with Wozniak and Jobs, he sold his 10% share of the company for $800. Here, I ask him if he regrets that decision. You know, I'm thinking about our eventual audience, Ron, when this recording gets released. And, you know, there'll be people that will ask the the reasonable question, which I suspect you've answered before, you know, that you you left Apple. Apple, of course, blows up, right? Today, it's worth, I think, a little over $2.8 trillion. Do you ever regret your decision to leave the company? Everybody asks that question. Yes. I left for very, very good reasons and have not regretted it for a moment. Mm. Okay. Not yes, once have I ever looked back and said, boy, I should have stayed with them. No. Like I said, I, I did not want to spend my days shuffling papers in a back room. I was a product development man. It's been an extraordinary year for me. I've been able to hear amazing stories from amazing people. And these are just some of my favorite. You can also go to Spotify and Apple Podcasts, the podcast player of your choice. And look for Eyewitness History. You can hear stories from Vietnam War veterans, World War II veterans. I spoke with Vince Sperenza, who fought at the Battle of the Bulge, which was the last major German offensive in World War II. Fighter pilots. I spoke with Colonel Bud Anderson, who is the oldest and only living Triple Ace fighter pilot from World War II. That was quite an honor. I was also able to speak with Professor Hope Harrison, who was in the air on her way to Berlin when the wall collapsed in 1989. And she was in the city for the subsequent 10 days following that. And she gives her testimony. Lastly, I was able to speak with Nicholas Meyer, who is a writer and director known for his best-selling novel, The 7% Solution, and for writing and directing the 1983 television film, The Day After, which still stands as the most successful made-for-TV movie of all time. You'll have to listen to that episode to find out just the extent of the impact that that movie had on nuclear policy. So it's been a wild ride for this last year. It's been such an honor to be able to curate and share these stories with you, listeners. So for now, I will say go ahead and subscribe to Eyewitness History on the podcast player of your choice, including Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And here's to another year. (music) 
Thanks for listening to this episode. For more information on eyewitness history, along with show notes and links to resources, go to parthenonpodcast.com, where you can also listen to some other great podcasts by the Parthenon Network, such as Scott Rank's History Unplugged, Steve Guerra's Beyond the Big Screen, and James Early's Key Battles of American History, along with many others. Thank you. Thank you.